of people in, in Amsterdam, Jan de Boer, uh, Diego Liska, who's a really good uh, graduate student, and Tarek Anous, who's a, a postdoc there. And um, what I'll be telling you about today is um, how to use you know, c crossing symmetry and modular invariance to constrain the dynamical information of conformal field theories, and in particular how to do that uh, using a re really nice technology based on the Virozova crossing kernel. Um, but uh, our, our motivation really comes from, from quantum chaos, and so I wanted to say uh, a little bit about that. So, so the, the real question that we would like to understand is, you know, what is quantum chaos um, in conformal field theories? Okay, and this is, we've heard a lot about two-dimensional gravity uh, and its quantum mechanical counterpart, but, you know, Eventually, we'd like to understand higher dimensional gravity that has propagating degrees of freedom, and so that uh, in ADS requires understanding conformal field theories, um, uh, you know, which are quantum field theories, and the question is how do we apply what we think we know about quantum chaos in, in quantum mechanics to conformal field theories. So uh, are you confining the particular dimension? Of no, what I'm going to, well, eventually, yes, because there's the word Vera Zorro here, and that was kind of the, <laughs> the theme of the workshop. But what I'll be saying for the first couple of minutes will be really general to all dimensions. Then the technology that I'll discuss will be specific to 2D CFDs, but what I'll say here is should work in, in any dimension. So, um, you know, in, in conformal field theories, the, the nice um, um, operators that we think about are local operators. Um, and, you know, we use representation theory of the conformal group, so we label these operators by their scaling dimension uh, and their spin. Um, and so these are local operators, and the nice observables that we like to compute are correlation functions of these local operators. Um, and um, through the state operator correspondence, um, uh, these are the same as, you know, energy eigenstates uh, on a d minus one dimensional sphere. So this is for CFTs in d dimension. Um, so we, the, the Hilbert space of the theory is, according, uh, is organized according to the local operators. Um, and we also have the, the, the operator product expansion, which says that, which is you know, an absolutely convergent expansion, which says that if we have two operators, let me just call them one and two, um, we have a convergent expansion um, where we can rewrite it as an infinite sum over all the other operators. It's the sum over k. And then there's just some um, uh, there's just some, some kinematic factor. Uh, and these, these coefficients that appear here, the fusion coefficients, or three-point coefficients, or OPE coefficients, they have various names. Uh, they're the other set of dynamical data of conformal field theories. Uh, and by repeated use of the OPE, if you know the, spec the spectrum of all local operators and all three-point functions, you can compute arbitrary point correlation functions, and so you can compute all quantities that you want in, in the CFT. Okay, so we typically put this, this data together, the, the scaling dimension, the spectrum of, of, oper of local operators, and OPE coefficients. And together we package this. This is called the CFT data. Okay, and understanding what quantum chaos means in conformal field theories is understanding what is the right set of properties uh, that this dynamical data needs to satisfy in order for the theory to be chaotic. So basically you say that conformal bootstrap is a chaos. Is, is what? The same thing as chaos. No, 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 he's going to give some more conditions. No, 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 no. Yeah, I'm saying there's condition on this data for the theory to be chaotic. Ah, so this is all just the data. This is the organizational principle, and then, you know, depending on what properties this data satisfies, the theory is going to be okay. integrable or chaotic. Okay. For example, you know, the spectrum of a free theory is going to be extremely regular. That's not chaotic, and, you know, the three Ising model will have a very complicated spectrum of local operators that would be chaotic. But that's the question, is how do we know what the right conditions are on this data such that we are allowed to call the theory chaotic? Um, 
Good, so, so let me just remind you uh, some things about quantum chaos that were already discussed quite a bit in, in this workshop. Uh, but, but, you know, property one is about the spectrum of the theory is that it's saying that, you know, the Hamiltonian of a, of a chaotic system uh, is well approximated, at least in the right regime, by a random matrix. Okay, so that's one thing that we would like to ask. So now I'm just reviewing what, what's known, say, in quantum mechanics. Um, and the second property that maybe we discussed a bit less um, is about uh, properties of, of operator matrix elements. Uh, and one of the nicest ways to organize this is along, alongside the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, uh, which says the following, that if you consider the matrix element of a simple operator, and so maybe the easiest thing to keep in mind here is think about a chaotic spin chain, um, that's extensive, and a simple operator would be an operator that has support only on a few spins uh, of the spin chain, uh, that these matrix elements have a universal structure in, uh, in, in chaotic theories. And the structure is the following. There's a diagonal piece uh, with a coefficient. And I'll, I'll describe all of these things in detail in just a second. Okay, so there's a general structure which is the following. There's a diagonal piece uh, multiplied by a function, and then there's an off-diagonal piece. Okay, and what are all these various things that are appearing here? Um, so f and g, they're smooth functions of the argument, of the arguments. Um, e bar is the mean energy between these two states. Uh, delta e is obviously just the difference. Uh, S is the entropy, and these smooth functions are not arbitrary, they're related to uh, the microcanonical one and two point functions of this operator O. So if uh, Rij is zero, then this is a free theorem? Uh, not necessarily zero, because in free theories you can still have, uh, you know, say this is O and this is O squared, oh. you could have an off diagonal term. Oh. Uh, but, but exactly, so the point is that, and what is Rij? Rij is um, often called, we call, it's often called a random variable. Um, uh, with, a, with a Gaussian distribution. But if I take linear basis in, in the space of operators, which should exist, uh, which means that O square is not allowed, just I take linear basis, then uh, the, these things get simplified? Uh, well, I mean, here, you know, we should, so maybe I should have said this, we should, first of all, we should think about very high energy states. These are, you know, uh, energy eigenstates that are relevant in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, and then you're, you have to study all of them. Um, so I wouldn't restrict on, you know, on a, Certain, in free theories on a certain number of operators. But in free theories, what you can do is you can see that this will be wildly violated because there's a lot of selection rules, the theory is free, it has an infinite number of conserved currents, so this is not random at all. Okay, so, so how, how should you think about ETH? You should think that you know, matrix elements of simple operators, they're basically diagonal with a large term, uh, and then there's a very small, exponentially small in the entropy off diagonal terms uh, that, with, with erratic numbers that are moving all around the place. Okay, and there's no proof of the, so, so ETH is very useful to understand thermalization, but there's no, certainly, we have a lot of mathematicians here, so there's not even a physics proof of ETH, but we're very far from having a mathematical proof of ETH. Uh, but you know, you can take your favorite chaotic spin chain, put it on a computer and, and, and study it, and numerically there's a lot of evidence uh, for, for, for ETH. So you mentioned some conditions, right, high energy? States only, right? Conditions. Yeah. yeah. So the further conditions where this formula at least empirically has been confirmed, right? Yeah, yeah. So you have to, you know, you go on a spin chain and you make the number of spin large, as large as you can do on your computer, and look at energies that are, you know, as big as you can. Quantify that in terms which regime? Oh yeah, this is meant to hold for for states that have an extensive amount of energy. So you know, in the thermodynamic limit, states that have a finite energy density. Yeah. You want to make one remark? Because in the case of the many-body system called SYK, 
yeah. you can actually use uh, techniques used to the co-adjoint orbit quantization, as Prangel and I did, to actually prove parts of the samsets. So there are some many-body theories where there is an analytic. Yeah, yeah, but that's in one theory, right? Like the the. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to say it also because yeah. what we used to do it is actually relevant for this. Co-adjoint orbit method. But yeah. So that's, this is sort of the miracle of SYK is that it's both chaotic and solvable somehow. So you can actually try to start probing these things. Yeah. Um, good, but there's just two there's just two two comments that I think are, are are important and that are not stressed often enough. So first of all, Rij is not a true random variable, right? If the Hamiltonian is fixed and the operator is fixed, Rij is a fixed set of numbers. Uh, but so I, I like to think about it as a pseudo random variable. It means it's fixed numbers, but they have a certain statistical distribution, which is Gaussian. Uh, and in fact, it's not even Gaussian. People say that because often what people care about in thermalization is computing the autocorrelation function, the two-point function. And for that, all you need is the Gaussian part of the distribution. Uh, but there are always non-Gaussianities. Okay? And for this ansatz to be consistent with higher point correlation functions, you know, matrix elements, or the, these, these random numbers, if you look at, you know, say, a four-point function, uh, there's some correlation here, the connected part, uh, is non-zero, okay? So it's not true that these have a Gaussian distribution, uh, but if you look uh, at how big the higher moments are in the relevant elements Rij, so if you look at Rij and look at the kth moment, okay, um, you can estimate it uh, to be further exponentially suppressed in the entropy. Okay, so the point is that uh, this is an approximation. Sorry, it is. Yes. E minus what? K minus one? K minus one over K times the entropy. Uh, so you know as K goes to infinity, these are further and further suppressed. Uh, this is what you get for K equals to two. Um, and you need to take them into account. And of course, when you compute a four point function, there's more sums over intermediate states. So even though they're further exponentially suppressed, they can give equivalent contributions. So this exponential that we have in the expression that's already one of those, or we kind of, I, I get confused. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so this, this, if you want, this is the ver everything that's here is the variance. Two point. And, it, and it's a and it's of size e to the minus so s. So we evacuated it from like now. No, this is, is not equal to two. Rij, right? Rij there, it's not the same as Rij. No, not quite. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, okay. I understand what. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, this is a bit schematic. Here we've already extracted the yes. the moment out mm -hmm. of it. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. How big can I take k? k means what does k oh, go into infinity? Well, okay. In principle, uh, if you first take the thermodynamic limit, you can make k as big as you want, but there's an order of limits issue, right? It's important that O stays as a simple operator, and if you look at a correlation function of too many simple operators, you sort of exit the, the simple regime, and so you have to be careful. Okay. But you know, if you first take the thermodynamic limit, you can imagine pushing, pushing this as far as you want. But there's also a bound on how, like, k equals infinity limit, you have e to the power minus s suppression. Yeah. So is there a physical way to understand why that's the maximal suppression allowed? Uh, probably. This is just a kinematic factor where you know you assume that the four-point function is order one. Um, there's three powers of the en entropy and intermediate states that appear here, but there's four coefficients, so that's how you get the three quarters. So, you know, k goes to infinity is just the limit of that. Basically, at that stage, you forget about it's like you, you forget about the fact that there's external states that reduce it by one, and it, just every single time you introduce a, a matrix element, you have to introduce one power of the entropy. That's why you get e to the minus s. Yeah. Sorry, what is the subscript on the Rij k? Kth moment. Okay. This is the size of the kth moment. But yeah, Anton's right. This is not exactly the same R as I wrote here. Um, but are there then just with the Gaussian distribution of what? Of variance one, or of variance uh, five. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, with mean zero and variance one. Okay. That's what people usually say, but but yeah. Okay. Yeah. This should be known actually for those models like three dimensionalizing it and so on. We should know what these Rijs mm -hmm. are now. Ah, uh, we would love to. I'll get to that. I'll get to that in a second. We, so maybe one day the bootstrap will tell us, but we're very far from the that. Bootstrap yet. is not close to. No, the not 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 even close, unfortunately. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Um, good. So, so this was all about quantum mechanics, but now how do we apply this to CFTs? Okay, so point one is easy. Oh, we, we can't see point one anymore. Um, I would make the report a little higher, actually. Tiny bit, right? It would help. Yeah, but okay. they're already they're already very nice. So, 
Um, well, that was a lengthy negotiation. That's as high as we could get. Uh, There's a roof constraint, I guess. Yes, yeah. in particular. Yeah. Going Good. through the roof, this was not allowed. So don't pay the very tall speakers. Right? Mm -hmm. um, Good. So, so point one is easy because we said that the Hamiltonian um, should, should be described approximately by a random matrix. But I also told you that you know, the, the, the spectrum of the theory on a sphere is just given by the set of local operators. Um, okay, so, so the energy eigenstates is the set of local operators, the delta i, let me suppress spin. Uh, and that, that just means that if the CFT is chaotic, there's, there has to be certain correlations among the distributions of local operators and CFTs. Um, and, and now the question is, you know, so this is the statement about the spectrum, but now there's a question of what do we say about OPE coefficients? And, and some of them have a natural answer in terms of the ETH. And those are OPE coefficients, Cij, so through the state operator correspondence, this is just a three-point function. Uh, in other words, an OPE coefficient. Um, so if you apply ETH to CFTs, it just tells you uh, that there should be a certain statistical distribution for the OPE coefficient. And remember that uh, here, these energies were high energy states. And this was a simple operator, which just means that the scaling dimensions of I and J they need to be very big. They go to infinity in the thermodynamic limit, but delta A is kept fixed. OK? And typically, we have a sort of uh, CFT phrasing for this. Even though there's no scale in the problem, we call these operators heavy, because they have a large scaling dimension, and we call these light. OK, so this is a statement about light, heavy, heavy OPE coefficients. OK, so if we, if we think ETH applies to CFTs, um, one of the conditions on quantum chaos is that the light, heavy, heavy OPE coefficients should have a certain statistical distribution. Um, but of course, that's not all the data of CFTs. And in particular, uh, what can we say about C light, light, heavy? So when two are kept fixed and one is sent to infinity, um, and what can we say about uh, OPE coefficients where all three operators uh, are, are sent to have very large scaling dimensions. So this is the question. Um, and we, we proposed, um, so I guess a year and a half ago, w with Jan, we made a proposition for, for what we think the properties should be. We called it the OP randomness hypothesis. Um, and what we argued is that these Coefficients should also be pseudo-random variables. Uh, with an approximately Gaussian distribution. Okay, and they're just slightly different than the, uh, the light heavy heavy ones because they don't have a mean. The mean for them is zero. They don't have this diagonal piece that's here. Uh, but other than that, they behave like random variables uh, with uh, a Gaussian distribution. Um, and you know, you can always pull out. So there's some, there's some variance that needs to be computed, but, but, but this is the property that these coefficients should satisfy. OK? Uh, so that's a, that's a, a conjecture, a hypothesis. Uh, it would be great to be able to prove or disprove it. Uh, but the problem is that it's very hard. And this is where I come back to your question, is you can ask, so what tools do we have? Uh, the problem is that maybe outside. It, sorry, yeah. but you, you're not saying about heavy, 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 right? Oh, both, both. Sorry. Both, both. Yeah. What, what about light, light, light? Ah, so light, light, light. Um, no, light, light, light. Don't need to have anything special because um, you know chaos is really about the thermodynamic limit, about very high energy states, um, and and light, light, light is just not in that sector. And in fact, we know of many CFTs that are chaotic. Like n equals to four super young mills is a chaotic theory, but it has an integrable sector, and C light 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 is completely integrable. I, I'm sorry, I, yeah. it's just a statement proof. I mean, you know, I thought people are working on proving that n equals to four is entirely integrable. No, I, I don't. Well, okay. <laughs> I think what people are hoping to be able to prove is that in the light sector, so in the perturbative sector, maybe they can prove that it's that it's integrable 
you know, to all orders in the 1 over n expansion. What, what they have right now is planar, and there's some work on understanding 1 over n corrections, and maybe one day they'll, they'll get to the all orders, but nobody believes, this is about, you know, planar limits, so correlators with small scaling dimensions. I don't think anybody believes that the spectrum of operators, you know, of heavy operators is integrable and n equals to 4. Okay, but I think this is a change of paradigm from, say, 20 years ago, but that's fine. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I, well, okay. I think even the, the hardest defensors of integrability, they were always talking about the planar sector. Well, here's one thing one can say, right? I mean, because this question does come up often. Uh, if it's really true that n equals 4 is fully integrable, then how can there be a black hole? Because we know it's a thermal state, and we know that integrable theories don't thermalize. Yeah, okay, but if, you have a, so if there's a temperature, then supersymmetry is broken anyway. I mean, but it's described, yeah. as a, it's described as some state in n equals to 4, right? Yeah. Uh, this I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think this is a side question. Uh, I, I mean, we could ask the experts, but I'm pretty sure that, you know, if you phrase it in this way, they would not make any statements about the integrability of something like okay. this. Okay, I mean, just to come back to this point, I mean, isn't it a bit counterintuitive to say a quantum field, I mean, a conformal field theory is in any dimension is chaotic? I mean, you know, there's... No, no, I didn't say that. I, I said that I'm going to... I want to develop criteria to know if a CFT is chaotic, okay, and these criteria work in any dimensions. Okay. I'm not saying all CFTs in all dimensions are chaotic. That's not true. A free theory is not chaotic. Yeah. Okay. Um, the ON model is not chaotic, and so on. So. I asked that question in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, don't you have some numeric to turn back to this? Numerical Numerics. Very good. So the problem exactly. So this goes back to Samsung's question, you know, what's the state of the art in the bootstrap? Say the 3D Ising model is, you know, what we think is the simplest chaotic CFT maybe. The bootstrap is so far from this, you know, the bootstrap can do up to delta equals six or something like that, right? It can get some some bound and some some good precision on the first few operators of the theory. But it's very, very far from extracting scaling dimensions or OPE coefficients of very heavy operators. It's just not there, it's far from being there yet. Um, and okay, there's a, I've talked to a lot of bootstrap friends about this, it's not even clear that they'll ever get there, but you there know. There's no chance that one can truncate the spectrum and get the only light states consistent so. No, yeah. There's no chance. No, because you always have operators in the OPE that appear that are heavier that you need further need to... But those coefficients cannot be set to zero consistently. No, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. So this would be the goal. Hopefully one day the bootstrap, you know, will be good enough. This would be the dream is that they'll solve the theory completely and then we can look at these numbers on a computer and see if this satisfies something like this. Uh, but, but unfortunately, we're, we're not there yet. Um, so, so that's a bit unfortunate. So, you know, just like the ETH, the ETH you can check uh, on a computer. We don't really know what to do here. So uh, what, what I want to do today is um, at least show that um, something like this is possible and can be consistent. Okay, and like, I, like I argued here, it's never true that things have a Gaussian distribution. Um, but what is true is that they have an approximately Gaussian distribution with further moments suppressed. So can we at least show that something like that is is happening here. That's what I'm going to. That's what I'm going to try to be doing. Um, and one thing that's important to say is that this dynamical data is very constrained by the CFT axioms, by modular invariance and crossing symmetry. Um, okay. So, for example, in two-dimensional conformal field theories, we have modular invariance, which is a property uh, of the finite temperature partition function. Um, okay. And if you, if you look at it in a limit uh, where inverse temperature goes to infinity, so when a temperature goes to zero, um, this is just given by the vacuum term with vacuum energy C over 12, one plus exponentially suppressed terms in beta. Okay. But of course, there's modular invariance. Uh, so uh, you can ask, how is that reproduced in the cross channel? beta, uh, rho of E i. Um, okay, and so here beta is going to infinity, so all of these terms are becoming order one, so you need to reproduce this sort of leading divergence, not by a single operator, but by the cumulative effect of many operators. Okay, and you work this out, and you see that for this to be consistent, what you find is the following expression. 
Okay, and this is just Cardi's formula. So we cannot derive the precise spectrum of operators, but we, what we know is that, you know, uh, their cumulative effect has to be this big. And uh, you can do the same with crossing symmetry. You can look at a four-point function, 01, 02, 03, 04. Um, and there's two ways to expand this. Well, there's three ways to expand this, but you can do 01, 02, 03, 04. Or, you know, 01, 04, 02, 03. Uh, and you can go to an OPE limit where you send x1 to x2 and x3 to x4, in which case this correlation function just becomes the following. Uh, and now you can ask how is this reproduced uh, in the other channel? And again, it's the same business. It's not reproduced by a single operator, but it's rather it's reproduced by the cumulative effect of many operators. So if you want here, we're just propagating the identity, but this is also equal to this, which is a sum over many heavy operators. Uh, and from this, you can extract uh, another formula, which says, so here there's OPE coefficients, you know, one, two, heavy, and there's another one here, three, four, heavy. Uh, and so you can find an asymptotic formula uh, for these OPE coefficients, which looks like this. Okay, so maybe you're less used to this formula. It's, if you want, it's the equivalent of a Cardi formula, uh, but that comes not from modular invariance, but from crossing symmetry. Um, and it tells you not, again, what the individual uh, OPE coefficients are, but what they need to be on average uh, for crossing symmetry to be satisfied. And what are the conditions on entropy function and at zero E bar from uh, crossing symmetry and things like that? Any conditions? Uh, yes, actually, there are formulas that you can find. In 2D CFTs, there are formulas that you can find for this and, and this. Yeah, but in general? In general, no. And even the entropy, we don't know, right? So we know how it scales with energy at large energies, but the prefactor is, is unknown. Don't you some paper that Zohar Margotsky wrote like months or some ago, some conjecture about the entropy? Uh, yeah, so if, if you talk about like supersymmetric indices, you can do a little bit better. Um, but in, gen so in general, you know that in the CFT, in the CFTD, this is just the fact that the free energy is extensive in the volume, but there's a number here out front, and that number we don't know from any first principles. In two, if you want the miracle in 2D CFT, then we know what the number is. It's the central charge, and we get that from modular invariance. But in general, we don't know what S of E is. Good. So, uh, so, so these, these are known as asymptotic formulas. Um, and what they, do, what they do is that they repackage the, the consistency conditions, modular invariant or crossing symmetry, they repackage it in a nice way. And you know, they don't tell us the individual values of the OP coefficients, but what they should be on average for things to be consistent with crossing and modular invariance. Okay, um, and what I want to do in this talk is uh, I'm going to use a technology that, so this was all, this was general to any dimension. Well, not this, this is 2D CFTs, but this, for example, is, yes, question. If you use the fact that the CFT has a gravity dual, you can probably say something about other dimensions as well. Uh, the spectrum. Here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so what you can do, if you assume that the theory has a gravity dual, you use the Einstein action, you get a number here, and that number is the same number that appears in the stress tensor two-point function, for example. So you know what it is. But there you're using input from gravity. I, I thought that there was a statement that that guy has something to do with the potential of the normalization group uh, uh, zomological type theorem. Remember, they have in higher dimensions analogs of the gradient flow. And that, that guy somehow is related to it. Oh, yeah, that's possible. Anyway, I think you can use the, the black hole. Space. Yeah, you can use the black hole to figure out that number. But, you know, from figuring out from first principles is completely unknown. And, for example, in N equals to 4 super Yang mills there's this famous factor of three quarters between the free energy and the free theory and in gravity. And that three quarters, 
I mean, gravity gives it to you, but we don't know how to extract it from first principles in the field theory. Yeah. Good. So, so what I what I want to do um, today is is um, give a framework, explain a framework that you know uh, enables us to extract many asymptotic formulas of this type that constrain. The statistical distribution. So you should think about this as constraining the statistical distribution, right? This is like the average of the true density of states, which is a set of delta functions. It's a smooth function because you average over a certain energy window. Um, and these constrain the dynamical data and their distribution. This is like the variance of the OE coefficients. Uh, and I want to explain the machinery to, to get at these asymptotic formulas that constrain the moments through something called the Verizon crossing kernel. Um, and in particular, my emphasis will be on trying to understand what the higher moments look like and if they are or not suppressed in the entropy. Okay, this was my sort of long motivation. I have until how how quarter to let me do ten minutes before twelve. Okay, yeah, no, that's perfect. Good. But are there any are are there any question uh, on the motivation? Are you using ETH to get a handle on the other ones? Or? No, I will not, no. Uh, in fact, I won't talk about ETH uh, like OPE coefficients, but what I do, you can apply it to those coefficients as well, uh, and you can derive. So again, ETH is very important to emphasize that ETH is a property about individual matrix elements, uh, but you can use the, the framework that I'll talk about to, to get averages of OPE coefficients, and you can show that they're consistent with ETH. Okay. But I, I should really stress that what I'm doing here is not proving this hypothesis. It's just checking that the, the, the various moments are compatible with something like this. Because these formulas, these formulas are true in free theories. See? Because the average is going to look the same in a free theory uh, than in a chaotic one. Um, but in the chaotic theory, um, you know, all the, all the individual elements are going to look random, whereas in the free field theory, there's going to be huge selection rules with very big coefficients and others that are zero. Actually, I was thinking that uh, the conformal group, if you are in, let's say, d dimensions, the conformal group would, uh, would give some restrictions because these coefficients are connected to the third Gordon coefficients and so on. Right? Oh, yeah. So this is also something that I should have said is, of course, in CFTs, you have to split operators between primaries right. and descendants. Right. And it's, ETH is, in CFTs is not true for descendants because, you know, the OPE coefficient of a descendant is related to that of a primary by a number that's not exponentially small if they're off diagonal. So this is pr what I'm going to, everything we should say is for primary operators. Yes, thank you. I should have said that. And the representation server the conformal group should give some restrictions on it. But we already used that. Uh, the, the conformal group used it to say that there's an OPE coefficient, right? Um, but it doesn't tell you what that number is. It tells you that there's a unique number in the product, but not what the number is. That's the dynamical data that's not fixed by, by the, the symmetry. Good. Uh, so, so, so the plan, um, I'll just review uh, how to use the Virozaro crossing kernel um, in sort of the simplest situation, which is four-point crossing. Um, and, and here I'll be reviewing a paper by uh, Alex and his collaborators from a few years ago. Uh, and then I want to tell you how it works for the higher moments. Okay, and we'll see. I'll, I'll give some examples. We'll see how much time, how much time I have. Um, okay, so let's consider the following four-point function, where I've put three of the operators at zero, one, and infinity. Um, and the fourth operator is at the point which is the independent cross ratio that you have for a four point function. Um, so, like I said, there's two different ways to write this. So, uh, you do the OP between 1, 2, and 3, 4. Uh, and uh, because of conformal symmetry, you organize operators according to uh, conformal blocks which resum the contributions of all descendants uh, from one primary operator. And I guess I should sort of really specify the channel that I'm working with. So this is the 1, 2, and 3, 4 conformal block. Um, but you can also expand in the other channel. Uh, 
And now here you have a different cross ratio. Oops, it's T. Bar. Okay, so this is the two different decompositions uh, of the of the. Um, this is the two different decompositions of the of the four-point function in terms of conformal blocks. And um, what you can do is um, you can basically write, so this, if, you, if you want, one way to think about this is that there's, these are two different bases in which you can expand the four-point function. Okay. And the idea of the Vera's or across the kernel is to write it, it's the change of basis between the two, uh, the two different decompositions. So let me define the Vera's or across the kernel. So, like I said, it's the, the crossing kernel is the object that you know starts from one basis. Oh, and I'll, I'll define p in a second. Here, I'm, I'm going to use Liouville variables because it's more convenient. Sorry, this is somewhat of a lengthy definition. Okay, but the, the Virozoa crossing kernel is this abstract object that if you want takes the, uh, a Virozoa block in one channel and gives you the Virozoa block in the other channel. No, but this is some kind of whatever, combination of some kind of generalized 3J, so 6J. Yeah, it's a 3J. It's exactly, sometimes it's called the 3J symbol, uh, the 6J symbol, 6J, sorry. Yeah. yeah, it has six, it has six, yeah. Exactly, it's the 6J symbol of the Virozoa group. Mm -hmm. um, so those things for Virozoa, I mean, we know, but I thought that they were five-dimensional versions of those for conformal blocks. Uh, there are people have started trying to write down the 6J symbol, for because example, in four dimensions. Walter Schomerus did some work. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So those are known exactly. Yeah, well, this is what I was going to get to. Um, the, the problem with trying to implement this precisely, if you want to do it directly, is that we don't know the conformal blocks. Bureau zero blocks are not known in, in closed form. Uh, but as you said, there's a sort of uh, miracle is that even though we don't know the conformal blocks, we actually know the crossing kernel in closed form. And this was written down by, Pon by Ponsor and Teschner. Um, for, 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 for only rational, so for, for non-rational theories, like Teschner wanted for Liouville and so on, it's still conjectural. There are, there are some things that follow from the homologicals, whatever, D, 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 Z, or, but uh, I mean, Teschner's formula, not proven. It's not proven? I don't think so. But why? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, it's an argument there in that community, but... Okay. Uh, there are some tests. You see, the problem is that it's continuous spectrum. Wait, are we talking about, sorry, the DOZZ formula is not proven? No, I mean, the, what, what statement is that, like from such homological right here, that the full-fledged four continuous series representations these uh, 6J symbols when everything is whatever generic is not known. But you can, you can assume that from AGT correspondence, if you postulate it, then we have a proof. Because you postulate AGT, AGT is supposed to be yeah. a formal blocks calculated there, then you check the formula. And, and, it, works. Works. and it works, yeah. yeah. But but okay, I, I, I did, as far as I understood, this was established, but you're saying maybe it's not no, proven. It's yeah. So from AGT it follows. Okay. Okay, so no problem. But okay. Teshner is right. Okay. But Teshner's delivery it's, itself, I don't, I don't know. So. But I understood that Vincent Vargas actually has some, at least he has some rigorous way of getting the DOZZ formula. So from that to this uh, crossing kernel. But this is a slightly different formula. I mean, it's consistent it's with the DOZZ, but. but yeah. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, in this talk I will assume that. That, that this is that the form that we have for the crossing kernel is the right one, um, and uh, I'm not going to write it on the board because it's it's very complicated. It's um, I mean it's very complicated. It's it's a known function in terms of um, ratios of products of, of Barnes double gamma functions, but it's a known function. Sorry, Alex, I just want to be precise, so I don't offend anybody. Yeah, yeah no, <laughs> I'm not offended. If you it's, add AGT to yeah, then, the then, then then it's cleaner. Good to go. Yeah. Okay, so you just say both. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, so it's known in closed form. 
okay? Um, and you can plug this into the crossing equations and, and extract an OPE density directly from the crossing kernel. Let me maybe write that formula on the board because it's sort of short. Um, do, I, do, do you anywhere want to take C growth to infinity? Because then it's a Pascal performance group and then it's 100% true. Yeah, uh, not yet, but eventually, yes. Um, yeah. For, for, for gravity comparisons, yes, but, but not yet. So you can write an, an, an OPE density, 1, 2 heavy, C, 3, 4 heavy, averaged, uh, just directly from the crossing kernel. T, C, 1, 2, T, C, T. And then this crossing kernel here. P, S, P, T. Oh, and I never, de I never uh, defined the variables P, but those are just the the, the Liouville momenta, which are related to the weights. And of course, there's always a at far. Okay, in particular, if you go to the kinematic limit where T is dominated by the identity. Sorry, what, what is S? Uh, S, is the, S is the cross channel. No, no, I mean PS, right? You have F, PS, but S doesn't appear in anything else. Oh, oh S, S is here. S is one of the channel. Yeah, but only on the left hand side. Oh, yeah, sorry. So this is S, uh, yeah. HS, sorry. Okay. Yeah, this is, so this is, this is labeling the weight of the heavy operator. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so if you go to a kinematic limit where, where S is very, very heavy, it'll project on the very, very light T, which is a single operator. If, say, 1 and 2 and 3, 4 are the same, this becomes just the identity. Okay, and then the sum disappears, and actually the OP coefficient of the identity with two operators is just one, and so the crossing kernel is done this way. Okay, uh, and then so if you want, you get a generalization of this formula for zero zero primaries uh, from this crossing kernel, and I could write it in closed form. I'm not sure how illuminating it would be, uh, but uh, it's just a known function for arbitrary central charge. For arbitrary central charge, yeah, yeah. Maybe I should write it down. Um, just so we know roughly what these expressions look like. For minimal model, this should be something trivial that we know. Uh, well, for minimal models, you can't really do this because there's a finite number of states. Right. So there's not really this limit to take in the first place. Uh -huh. So, so this, this technology works for C greater than 1. No, no, sorry. If I take PQ minimal model, take Q goes to infinity. Uh, you could try to study that limit. Uh, that's like C approaching one, but you, we have to be careful. I, I mean, I'm going to write down the expression in a second. Uh, I'm going to write it in Uville variables. I mean, you guys are used to this, so maybe you'll recognize. But if C is smaller than one, these formulas are uh, can't really be trusted. So we should really apply this this technology. C, so again. Not, C doesn't need to be large, but just greater than one. So the the, the setup where this is under the best control is rational CFTs with only zero zero algebra and C greater than one. Not that we know many of those theories, but what's the... Uh, if you see more than 25, they're almost the same as those that see less than one. Almost. That's right. Uh, so, uh, heavy, C, 3, 4, heavy. Average is like uh, 4 to the minus PS squared. Uh, I'm writing everything in, sorry, time, in, in Newville variables. So apologies, and I, I'm not going to waste too much time uh, defining them. And actually, I'm even writing a hybrid thing because there's some C's here, but OK. H-I uh, log P-S. Log. I guess I call this P-heavy or something. OK. So this is this is the this is the this is the closed form expression. Okay, it is what it is. And so in this paper by Maloney and, and friends, what they did is they used the same. Here I did it for four point crossing on the plane. Um, that gave us C light light heavy squared. Um, so this is from four point on the plane. Um, but you can also do um, C light heavy heavy. This is what like what Eric was asking. This comes from modular invariance of the two-point function on the torus. Um, and you can also get C heavy, heavy, heavy squared. This comes from modular invariance of the genus 2 partition function. Okay. 
And these are always the squares, so these are always the, what you're always extracting here is the variance of the distribution that we care about. Why did you say that I cannot take the model which has more than just Verasor? Let's say I take uh, SLN. Uh, oh, no, I think, I think you could and you can apply it and it should work, but you know, then again, you're not really exploiting the full symmetry. Then what you should do is write down a crossing kernel for the extended Carroll algebra symmetry. And that's known, again, from same business. It, it, it is known? Well, it's a T for Okay, okay. Okay. Okay, okay, yeah. I didn't know that, but then one could do the same. Um, very good. Uh, and I guess here I introduced the, the, the crossing kernel F, but there's also the modular kernel S that is the equivalent for modular transformations. Good. Um, so I, I see that I'm, I'm running behind, but that's fine. Let me just explain how it works to, for the non gaussianities and, and the main point is that this crossing kernel, it acts locally. Uh, so you can, you can use it to reduce, um, you know, complicated diagrams into smaller diagrams. So let me just show how that works for the genus G partition function in what I'm going to call the skyline channel. So here I'm going to write down a decomposition of a genus G partition function in a particular channel, which uh, we decided to call Skyline, okay, for reasons that if I don't screw up my drawing, should be clear. Okay, it looks like New York, roughly speaking. Um, okay, so this is a, a decomposition. So, so the idea is that these are all the OPE coefficients. You can do a, a pair of pants decomposition of the, the Riemann surface, and I, I wrote a trivial diagram here. Uh, and depending on how many intermediate buildings you put here, that calculates the genus of the surface. And so how do, you, how do you use the crossing kernel to extract the OP density uh, from this thing? So let me just label the operators, and I'll, I'll do one example, just so you see how it works. Um, two, three, uh, and six. Okay, so I'm labeling all the operators. So the first thing that I do is I do a crossing transformation on the operator one. Okay, and now, the diagram looks different. The bottom has not changed. Um, but now, so five is still here. Uh, but now we have an operator one prime running here. Uh, this is two, this is six, and this is three, and this is four. Okay, I just, I just did crossing for this operator here. Very good. Uh, and now I do crossing for the operator 3. And now it looks like this. Just trying to get the numbers correctly. So 3 prime, 1 prime, 6, 5, 2, and 4. Okay, now what I did is I did crossing for the operator 3. Okay, you get this. And then finally, I do an S transform on 4, 4 prime, which gives, me, which gives me the same thing. Um, 3 prime, 4 prime. This is just doing the modular transformation to this cycle here. Uh, and now what I can do is I can make 4 prime the identity. So I'm trying to extract something when all these operators are heavy, which in the cross channel means they should be light. So I can set the identity to 4 prime and the identity to 3 prime. Okay, and this is now a lower genus Riemann surface, which is related to a higher one. Uh, so if you want, you have a skyline with, I don't know, 10 buildings here, and you have a skyline here with nine buildings plus a set of, of kernels. So this is like the 9-11 move. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon. Uh, too soon. Uh, okay. Anyway, sorry for that bad taste joke. Um. Uh, so the point is that um, it acts locally, so you can reduce the number of you can reduce the number of operators, um, and you can reduce the, the genus, and you can write genus G equals genus G minus one uh, times a combination of crossing kernels. Okay, so this gives you a recursive formula, and you know what it is at genus two uh, by this thing here, and so you you solve it completely, and you can write down an all order expansion, an all order formula. On the composition, you can you can write everything explicitly. Sorry. If you use pan decomposition of Riemann surface. 
Yes. You can write everything in terms of the four points and the uh, one. That's right, but there's a subtlety is that it's not clear um, that you can find a cross channel where the identity dominates. So you can always decompose things using the pair of pants and composition, uh, but it's not always true that you find a set of moves that reduces heavy to, to light in a cross channel. That's, that's, actually, that doesn't always work. Okay, so let me just write down some formula. Skyline. Um, this is what the formula looks like. So NC is, labels the number of OPE coefficients, of heavy, heavy, heavy OPE coefficients that enter into the skyline decomposition. Uh, sorry, I just want to get the factors correctly. OK, and there's even some uh, polynomial piece that we can write down. OK. So this is the final formula that you get for this. Um, and so this is by exploiting genus G modular invariance. But you can, if you want a hybrid formula that constrains the higher moments of light, light, heavy, and C heavy, heavy combined, you could look at higher point functions on the plane. And there's an equivalent formula that you can write down. So there is exponential of delta uh, log delta. So you somehow an exponential. Oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no factorials. Um, uh, what is NC? NC is the number of OPE co so I'm going to schematically call it NC. It's the number of OPE coefficients that enter into the decomposition in the skyline channel. OK? Um, and in particular, this you may recognize is basically the Cardi formula, or the, the Cardi formula multiplied by a prefactor. Uh, so you can divide by the number of, or, or you know, take the, the, the uh, I mean, look at the, the, the weight in individual OPE coefficients from this formula and look at how it scales with the number of um, OPE coefficients. So this is what I was calling before the case moment. You just normalize by the density to some power. Sorry? You just normalize by the density to some power. Is that what you're saying? No, no, no. I'm saying this is a formula for n OPE coefficients. I'm saying, you know, take the nc square root um, to, to obtain the, the net weight per OPE. Uh, and what you get or now I just use the Cardi formula to, to say what S is. This is like S of delta. Um, okay, and this th you should compare this with what I was writing at the beginning for ETH, uh, which was like Rij case moment. Okay, and the structure is very similar. There's new integers, five and four, why they appear, I can't tell you. This is some, some voodoo of the Verizon crossing kernel. Uh, but the important physical fact is that, you know, the higher moments are further and further suppressed in the entropy. Wait, so, yeah. first of all, now maybe uh, Anton's question is important because now, um, where do we start normalizing? I mean, the thing that RIG is kind of schematic, whereas the C is now uh, exact. I mean, it's not true that the Rij has this asymptotic formula because you have to take a e to the minus s over 2 outside. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So for it, this was maybe a bit murky in the way I did it for ETH, but here this formula works also for the Gaussian part. So this just tells you. But why do we compare it to this then? Sorry, that's what I'm saying. Is, is it not up to, up to a factor of 1 minus s? And doesn't that introduce some more factors of numbers? But it doesn't scale with k. What, the, what counts is how things. Scale with k with the number of OP coefficients. You want to shift this by one half by absorbing the. Yeah. You know what I mean. What, what what matters is that it decays as k gets bigger. So, so by the way, what is j? That's five. J. Five. Oh, that's five. Sorry. Yeah. That's just. <laughs> j equals five. Okay. J equals five. <laughs> <laughs> cool. One thing bothers me here actually is that the central charge disappears. No, no, it's in here. It's in here. Oh. S, so S, S, S is 2 pi. S, S is, this is, if you want, this is 2 pi. Oh. And it seems like that, that particular rate could have been calculated completely in semi classic. Because that limit when C goes to infinity, delta, I mean, three times delta is finite. 
that thing is completely semi-classical calculable. Uh, th this? The exponent. You said S is C yeah, yeah. minus 1 times delta. Yes. Square root. Yes. That can be calculated for large C because that's a leading term. That's all you need. That's right. So but it but can be calculated semi-classical. Oh, no, no. After you know the form. Yes. Uh, after you know the form. Yeah. 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 But so these numbers were not known. Actually, it wasn't even clear to us if the higher moments would be suppressed. But you know, you work it out, and they are. Um, and, and you can do similar things for, you know, the crossing equation of many, 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 many point functions uh, on the plane uh, and, and get similar types of expressions where you can also show that the moments are suppressed. So even the number can be calculated because uh, there is no one over C correction to entire formula. If you look at it. Besides wondering that if, when you wrote the CTH formula, I didn't ask you, I wanted to ask you. Does that have a meaning semi-classical? If I have h bar and I expand in h bar, what is the meaning of the formula in perturbative h bar expansion? If you formula, does it have a meaning? Um, in the h bar expansion? Yeah, I have a quantum system. I want to do simple calculations. Just one loop in h bar and check this. But uh, uh, I do not. I, uh, what do you want to calculate even? No, it checks the ATH. I mean... Yeah, but I mean, you, the calculations that you have to do, I mean, he's talking about uh, states that have an extensive amount of energy in the thermodynamic. Yeah, the, the expansion because parameter is the thermodynamic entropy. You're not going to get very far by doing h bar expansion. I well, first of all, you have to make the states. Well, maybe yeah. you're the chair. Maybe we should do the discussion. No, I mean, I, I give him a time. I can, I'm sorry, I, I'm probably using my... Chair thinks that usually questions during the lecture or after lecture is a commutative. So um, yeah, maybe let's just let me just say one more thing related to something that you ask, and then I'll, I'll finish, and then we can move on to discussions. Two three minutes anyway. Okay, uh, good. So um, so I'm, I'm not going to write the formula for this, but there's a similar formula, and so there's many things that you can do. And ideally, what one would like to do is have a complete description of all possible decompositions of OPE coefficients and constrain their moments. Uh, but we can't quite do that uh, because there's some channels in which you, you can never find a cross channel where the identity dominates. So let me just give an example at, at, at genus 3. Let me just see that uh, I get the right topology. So at genus 3, there's the skyline, which is the one I talked about. Uh, there's the necklace. Uh, and there's this sort of hybrid one. I'm not sure how to call it. Uh, all of these we can get. So we have asymptotic formula for all of these. Uh, but there's two that we cannot get, which are these and, uh, sorry, this was not the necklace. This was like the dumbbell, but this is the necklace. Uh, and these we cannot get. So you can play around with this, try to do all the crossing moves or the modular moves that you want, and you never find the channel where you can project to the identity. So it doesn't mean that we can't qualify these moments, but it means that you somehow have to resum, and we don't know how to do that yet. Um, Seems like we need a new idea. Um, but okay, I'm out of time, so let me just let me just finish. Uh, I talked about quantum chaos in CFTs today, and what I wanted to do is, even if we can't test the OP randomness hypothesis, at least try to see if the constraints from crossing symmetry and modular invariance uh, give us moments that are compatible with something like that. And I presented a formula for the you know the all genus skyline channel. Um, decomposition of heavy, heavy, heavy OPE coefficients, and indeed the higher moments are suppressed with the entropy. Um, okay, let me stop here.